Juneteenth, June 19th. And we like to say as black folks, Juneteenth rather than June 19th. Because it's our way as African people or as people from Africa or as black people on this earth to make language something that's always fluid. We don't care if it's not all of those things that are so connected to what's written on a sheet of paper. In other words, proper English. We talk in a way that people understand what we're talking about. So if I say we talk in a way that everybody understand what we talking about, people understand that. And I know there are some people who criticize me who say, no, you know, you should speak properly. They want to, you know, you know, you know, people who want to correct your English. I remind them when they want to correct my English. Number one, that I was an English teacher at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, an English teacher at Marquette University, an English teacher at Dominican College and an English teacher in Milwaukee Public Schools. And I speak white English quite well. But since I ain't white, I don't bother talking it all the time. And if anybody don't understand what I'm saying when I talk, they're saying that because they don't want to understand it or they think white is the best way to talk. But they don't understand why we talk the way we talk. See, we celebrate what we are. Juneteenth, we celebrate our survival. See, Juneteenth is not just a day to celebrate what was read in Galveston, Texas, you know, back on Juneteenth. No, Juneteenth is a day to celebrate our survival in this country. We have come through the worst experience in the history of the world. Now, I know there's a whole lot of people who talk about other people who lost millions of people and everybody wants to cry for them. Nobody wants to cry for us. We lost over 200 million people in the evasions of Africa and in what happened, the thing that's called slavery and the things that are still happening now. We lost over 200 million people and we still survived. Now there are some say, well only 5 million people came to the United States. We're not just talking about the United States. Other people don't talk about what happened to them just in the United States. They talk about what happened to them in Nazi Germany and Europe, etc. So over 200 million of us died in the thing and in the hundreds of years that they call slavery. 300 plus years that they called the thing slavery. 200 million of us died. But we survived and we survived. And that's very important. And we kept being who we are. See, we kept talking like we talk. That's very important to understand. We kept talking like we talk, okay? For example, in Africa, this is called, okay, Bahana in Wolof. It's called Fila in Yoruba, okay? So my daddy said to me one time, boy, where your hat at? And I know some English people would say, oh, you don't put a preposition at the end of a sentence. At in African language is not a preposition. It's a locative, which means it's where it's located. Where is your hat located? Which is what he said, not where is your hat. Where is your hat located? Where your hat at? Okay, in Yoruba, you would say Nibo Nifi Laurewa, where your hat at. In Wolof, you'd say Finle Sambachana Nech, Finle Sambachana Nech, which means where your hat at, which is why we black folks say where your hat at when we want to know where your hat at. And if anybody tries to say you're saying it wrong, just tell them you ain't white, tell them you talking black. Here's another thing we always say things like I've been done did that. And the reason why we say that is because the African languages have more tenses than European languages. There's only about four in European language, past tense, past perfect, future, etc. But in Africa, there are seven. There's a past tense that said, I did it. There's a past tense that said, I did it a while ago. I done did it. There's a past tense that says, I've done it a real long time ago, which is like, I've been done did it, okay? And then that I've been done did it is like, hey man, why you keep asking me that? I've been done did that. See, so been done did that carries with an attitude too. Did you do that? I did that. Did you do that? Man, I done did that. Man, did you, I, man, I've been done did that. See, that's how African people talk. And we take that language, we take the language and we take European 
words and put them on African sentence structure. That's called a pigeon when you're talking about true English. So what we do is we still speak an African sentence structure and we put European words into it because we speak the European words. Most of the time when people learn another language, they simply take the words of that language and put it on the, put it on the sentence structure that they're used to. But understand, we African people have the most complicated and the oldest languages on earth. I don't have to tell you that originally people came from Africa and they were talking something, okay? They were talking, they were talking. And when they were talking, let me tell you, that was the origin and the beginning of humanity. So what's the oldest language on earth? Well, it's gotta be black because we the oldest people on earth. That ain't even complicated. Now, one of the things that we did too was we made sure that everything gave us lessons. This particular instrument is called a shekere. It's a gourd and a gourd is like in the pumpkin family. And when this dries though, you can hear it. It dries hard. And you know, when a pumpkin squishes up, but it's a gourd and of course the gourd was used by all the people all over the world in tropical areas where it grew whether that's Asia, Africa, whether it's over here in what we call the Americas, the islands, wherever they grew, it grew in tropical areas. But what they would do is they would take the gourd and they would take all the seeds out of the inside and all the paper and seeds out of the inside. And when they took the paper and seeds out of the inside, it was hollow. Then they'd make a net and on the outside of it, they would put the beads. So this does not have a anything inside but the beads are outside and it's played by shake it but now just a minute this is a testimony to intelligence and also a testimony to stupidity now it's a testimony to intelligence because where these grow particularly in Africa you can store things in it you can store beans, you can store peas, you can store coins, you can store pins and buttons. And, but in Africa, they stored water in it. Because this is a plant, it's porous. Water will slowly soak through to the outside so the outside gets a little bit damp. Then they would simply hang it up with the water inside and when the wind blew past it, it would cause evaporation, which would make the outside, you know, evaporation cools things. It'd make the outside cool and that made the water inside cool. And that's how African people kept water cool to drink before refrigeration was invented. That's a testament to intelligence. But it's also a testament to stupidity because it's also called a sucker trap for catching monkeys. The hunter will tie a rope to the neck of the gourd and then tie the end of the rope to a tree. And inside the gourd, he'll put a piece of shiny paper. Uh, maybe tinfoil gum wrapper or whatever would shine at the time outside he'd put a few pieces of corn and a few peanuts or nuts and the monkey would come by and uh, eat the corn eat the peanuts and he'd notice the shiny paper inside now monkeys are like human beings they're curious and intelligent but with monkeys their curiosity is stronger than their intelligence so the monkey curious about what that is he reaches inside the gourd to get it when he reaches inside the gourd to get it, the opening of the gourd is only large enough for the monkey to squeeze his hand in very carefully. When he grabs the shiny paper and makes a fist, he can't get out. He's stuck. He doesn't know what to do. Now, the only thing he'd have to do to get free is what? Just let go. But he's too stupid to know that. He doesn't let go because he thinks he's got something. No, but something has him. Something has, him. all he'd have to do is let go. But he runs around screaming all day, ah, screaming and screaming. And the hunter comes along, hop, hits him in the head with a stick and he wakes up in a cage wondering, how'd I, ow, how, how, ooh, that hurts. How'd I get here? How did I get here? He got there because he wouldn't let go. He got caught in a sucker trap. So what we did as a people when we got here, we had these stories that we told our children. Stories based on nature. Whenever they saw a gourd, they would remember, don't get caught in a sucker trap. Don't get caught in things that are set up to make you a victim. So we had to be very wise as people here to survive this far, to be always clear that there are traps all around us, particularly our young black people, there are traps all around us, just waiting for us. Those traps are like 
let's make let's let's do something ah okay any kind of drug i don't care what it is marijuana alcohol blah all of that tobacco okay that not only that okay uh carrying weapons uh running with gangs i know i'm a former gang member i was young i was stupid i was dumb but like that's how young people are but check this out grown people sucker trap you know, credit cards that come in the mail next thing you know you got credit up to kazoo went and bought a new television we didn't need and uh, a lot of us including myself have been in that sucker trap so we got to avoid sucker traps. So that's what we as a people did. Make sure that we let things in nature, which was an African way of teaching, let things in nature be those things that teach us. That is the basis for the shekere or the basis for the gourd. The gourd teaches, the gourd stores, and the gourd becomes an instrument. Okay? Now, one of the things is, a guy named Joseph Richter, there was a thing in China. It was an instrument which you would blow wind over. And when you blew wind over that instrument, there was a reed inside that would wiggle. When I was little in Kansas and Arkansas, we would take a blade of grass and hold it between our thumbs and we would blow and they let that little blade of grass or that leaf and that would make that sound like, ooh, really high sound. That was called a free reed. The Chinese had an instrument called the sheng and the sheng was what was a free reed. Now. There are instruments like that that people made all over. But Joseph Richter, what Joseph Richter did in Germany is he made an instrument where if the wind moved one way, it would, it would vibrate and make a sound. But if you pull the wind the other way, it would vibrate and make a sound. And he's credited with making what we know of as the harmonica. The harmonica that we see today. Other peoples develop it in different places, but he made it so if you pull, which is the, a draw, or you push the wind or pull, you get It's the only instrument that you play breathing in and out. Now, what African people did, in Africa, we blew the notes. We sang in, after, you know, we were invaded over years and certain sad things happened. We had a style of singing, and that style of singing had a descending melody pattern, a rising melody pattern, a descending melody pattern. And when we got over here, we did that on European instruments and it became what we call the blues. And when black folks picked up the harmonica, we did that with the harmonica. In other words, we blew the notes. And to blew the note means to take one note and to pull it down or pull it up. Now you see when they're playing the blues guitar, they pull the string, which makes the guitar, or makes the tone rise. The Ngondi instrument is a one-stringed instrument, and it's played by pulling the string, moving up and down the string, like, like it's a fretboard, but you pull it and it goes, whoa, whoa, like that. So we said, okay, the old blues cat said, well, I'm gonna put that sound into a harmonic. right now let me tell you something Gil Scott Heron said ain't but three kinds of blues there's the I ain't got no money blues and the I ain't got no, then there's the I ain't got no woman blues and then the third kind of blues is oh it's a hard blues it's the I ain't got no money and I ain't got no woman blues. He said, them the blues, okay? Sonny Boy Williamson and others said, hey, there's a worse blues than that. It's called the nine below zero blues. <laughs> you gotta look up Sonny Williamson and check that out, okay? And uh, the nine below zero blues, he says, he says, ain't it a pity? 
people ain't it a crying shame. He says, uh, oh, ain't it a pity? People, ain't it a shame? I'm not gonna tell you the whole song, but you gotta check it out. He said, I declare it's a pity, and God knows it's a crying shame. Oh, yeah. My woman wait till it was nine below zero, and then she put me down for another man. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just like stop a minute and get back to the point. The point is simply this. No matter what happened, we as a people were able to find a way to celebrate the love we had for ourselves, celebrate our connection to our past, never forget our history, our tradition. Somehow, with all the efforts done to wipe that out of us, we still have it. It will not go. As a matter of fact, we have transformed the people in the United States culturally, musically, artistically, more than they have transformed us. Carl Jung was traveling in the United States. <clears throat> and when he was traveling in the United States looking at what he called the colonists, he said, those white people, I'm paraphrasing, this isn't his exact quote, in the United States are a strange group. He said, they walk like the black people there. They, they talk like the black people there, waving their hands wildly in gesticulation. They even throw their heads back and open their mouths wide when they laugh, just like the black people there. He was amazed how much white people acted like us. The point is simply this. I don't care what they do to us. Do not lose hope in this time. Celebrate Juneteenth. Don't lose hope. And all of you think, oh, it's just terrible, it's just terrible. We have been through worse. We came through the thing that they call slavery. They came through the thing they call Jim Crow. We came through civil rights, black power, black lives, matter, all of that. And again, this is a time to never forget what we've been through, to keep doing what we need to do to get where we know we should be, but never ever forget to stop a minute, celebrate what we were able to accomplish, and celebrate that in spite of all the attempts to get rid of us, we still here, we still magnificent, we still beautiful people, and that's why we go out and celebrate Juneteenth.